Edgeworks Nebula. Welcome to You Have My Sword, a Tolkien podcast. In this kickoff episode, we are going to talk about Tolkien himself, who was such a sexy baby that somebody kidnapped him. Think I'm joking? Let's talk about it. John Ronald Ruel Tolkien was born on January 3rd, 1892 in Bloemfontein, South Africa. His parents were Arthur Ruel Tolkien, who was an English bank manager, and his mother was Mabel Suffield. Arthur and Mabel had left England when Arthur was promoted to head the Bloemfontein office of the British bank that he worked at. Tolkien had one sibling, his younger brother, who was named Hilary Arthur Ruel Tolkien. Tolkien's mother, Mabel, taught both her kids at home. Ronald, as he was known in the family, was an attentive and highly academically interested child, which I think is a nice way of saying that he was a fucking nerd. Tolkien's mother taught him a lot about botany, which is something he grew to have a very deep interest in. Tolkien has said numerous times that he enjoys both the look and the feel of plants, and as a child spent a lot of his time drawing landscapes and trees. Botany aside, Tolkien's favorite academic topic was language. Not a huge surprise here, and his mother taught him the basics of Latin very early on setting his love of languages and language creation into motion, which would obviously go on to influence his creation of languages for his works. Tolkien spent a lot of his early years inventing alphabets and languages with his cousins, who very quickly grew out of it, but Tolkien never did. Okay, imagine just waking up one day and you're like, I'm going to invent a fucking language. I'm like living on a fucking prayer Bon Jovi style, every day of my life, I do not have the bandwidth to invent a language, let alone speak the one language I know, well, half the time, as is evident if you're listening to this. Like, simply insane to just wake up and invent languages. Like, what the fuck? Um, anyways, so, when Tolkien was a small child, um, he was bitten by a baboon spider, and I don't mean to laugh, there's literally nothing funny about this. <laughs> um, baboon spiders are honestly just like a large type of tarantula, and while they are venomous, they are not very dangerous to humans. Um, they are purely defensive creatures. Um, a lot of people have gone on to say that this incident um, in Tolkien's early life went on to inspire the spiders in Mirkwood and Shelob herself. But Tolkien has said 100 fucking times this is not the case, that he does not remember being bitten, and that he has a great respect for spiders, which is why he has included them in his work. Okay, so this next part is my personal favorite part of Tolkien's life story, actually. Um, when Tolkien was super young, a young family servant who thought Tolkien to be a beautiful child took Tolkien, when he was a literal baby, back to his neighborhood to uh, show him off, parade him around, literally brought baby Tolkien back home to show his homies what a sexy baby Tolkien was, and then, before the sun came up, returned Tolkien safely the next morning in what was probably the politest kidnapping in history. Honestly, just so insane to me that someone is like, this baby's hot, my homies have to know about it, I will return this child. So crazy to me. Um, just so wild. Okay, anyways, so... Tolkien could read by the age of four and could write fluently soon afterwards. He read a shit ton of books growing up. He fucking hated Treasure Island and the Pied Piper and thought Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll was amusing but disturbing. He liked stories about Native Americans and the fantasy works of George MacDonald. So, George MacDonald is often regarded as the modern father of fantasy writing, his most known works being The Princess and the Goblin, uh, At the Back of the North Wind, and Lilith, 
uh, to name a few, although his work is pretty extensive. Um, MacDonald has been quoted saying, I write not for children, but for the childlike, whether they be of five or 50 or 75. Uh, this quote is something Tolkien uh, took to heart in his writing. MacDonald served as a mentor to Lewis Carroll of Alice in Wonderland fame. I'm sorry, hang on. Uh, this is a George MacDonald podcast now? The number you have reached has been disconnected. Bear with me, I beg of you. This is interesting shit. Um, so, MacDonald's kids loved the first draft of Carol's Alice so much. It's actually what convinced Carol to take it to publication. Now, imagine if McDonald's kids were like, this shit is straight trash, my guy. What the fuck were you thinking? We never would have got American McGee's Alice adaptation video game, which took years off my life with its horrible jump controls. Anyways, back to Tolkien. <laughs> when Tolkien was only three, he went to England with his mother and brother on what was intended to be a family visit. His father now, unfortunately, died in South Africa of rheumatic fever before he could join them. Uh, this left the family without an income, so Tolkien's mother took the kids to live with her parents in Birmingham. From what I understand, uh, rheumatic fever is the result of um, untreated strep throat or scarlet fever. Um, that can cause heart failure, which seems to be what took Tolkien's father pretty quickly. So, obviously, not good. Just some real Grey's Anatomy shit. Um, around 1896, Mabel and the boys moved around to different areas of what we now call Birmingham. Um, he spent a lot of time at his Aunt Jane's farm, which was actually called Bag End, going on to honor his time there in his works. Now that's a fucking fun fact, right? So Tolkien's mother Mabel died in 1904 when Tolkien was just 12 years old. Um, Mabel died from diabetes at the age of 34, which was considered a long life for someone with diabetes considering insulin would not go on to be discovered for nearly, God, I think two decades later. Um, fun fact, actually, Canadian orthopedic scientist Frederick Banting and his team won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for the discovery of insulin. Discovering insulin could have made Banting a very, 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 very Elon Musk level rich man. But he decided to give the patent away for free. He wanted insulin to be available to everyone for free. Spoiler alert, here in America, <laughs> that shit ain't free for everyone. We don't have time for my American healthcare rant. I am fighting for a quality of life. It's an opportunity agenda that includes Medicare for all, increasing the minimum wage, canceling student debt. I want people to live. So let's just jump in and talk about teenage Tolkien. Um, sweet teenage Tolkien spent his formative years deep in study, straight reading book after book, learning languages, and hanging with the lads, who he had a very wholesome secret society with. Tolkien and his three best friends had a club called TCBS, which stood for Tea Club and Barovian Society, where they'd often meet to drink tea secretly in the school library. Pretty wholesome shit, right? These friends in his club, in particular, had a huge impact on his love and pursuit of poetry. In 1911, Tolkien went on a summer holiday in Switzerland, a trip that he recollects vividly in a 1968 letter noting that Bilbo's journey across the Misty Mountains is directly based on Tolkien's adventures with a party of 12 as they hike from Interlaken to Lauterbrunnen. I hope I said that correctly. Tolkien would go on to explore so much of Switzerland that he cites one of his greatest regrets is ever leaving. No surprise that he tried to capture some of the landscape and memories in his work. Okay, so I have some questions here and I'm hoping if you're listening, maybe you have some answers for me. 
Um, while the films were shot in New Zealand, Switzerland was the inspiration for many of the lands in the book. Um, which makes me wonder why they didn't shoot in Switzerland or at least film B-roll. Um, because I don't even think they shot any Swiss B-roll for the films, whether The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings. I mean, New Zealand ended up being perfect, though, honestly, and I know they lured Peter Jackson there with a pretty enticing tax credit to shoot there versus shooting in Australia, where Peter Jackson initially planned, but still, it seems weird, no Switzerland at all. I don't know, uh, obviously, how film laws work, so if any of y'all know why Switzerland didn't make the cut, I'd sincerely love to know. Um, I, I just figured it'd be easy to cut in some B-roll to honor Tolkien in this way. Um, so I'm sincerely interested in knowing why, uh, that never happened, I guess. Anyways, now we are going to jump tits first into Tolkien's love life, which is romance in the truest sense of the word. I could probably do an entire episode on this romance alone, but we can save it for the Baron and Luthien episode. So, um, hang on, let me take a sip of root beer. Hang on, this is an ASMR podcast now. So, at the age of 16, Tolkien met Edith Mary Bratt, who was three years his senior when he and his brother moved into the boarding house where she also lived. According to Humphrey Carpenter, who wrote the authorized biography for Tolkien, he said, Edith and Ronald took to spending time at Birmingham tea shops, especially one which had a balcony overlooking the pavement. There, they would sit and throw sugar lumps into the hats of passers-by, moving to the next table when the sugar bowl was empty. With two people of their personalities and in their position, romance was bound to flourish. Both were orphans in need of affection, and they found that they could give it to each other. During the summer of 1909, they decided that they were in love. Just like that. Okay. Just like, give me a minute. This shit turns my brain into a fucking serotonin factory. So, Tolkien's guardian, uh, Father Morgan, I don't know if I mentioned this, but when Tolkien's mother passed away, she assigned guardianship um, of both her sons to her close friend, Father Francis Morgan. Um, Mabel told Father Morgan that her wish was that he bring the boys up as, quote-unquote, good Catholics. Father Morgan considered it, quote-unquote, unfortunate that his surrogate son was romantically involved with an older, Protestant woman. Some real Romeo and Juliet meets the Holy War shit going on here. Tolkien wrote that the combined tensions contributed to him having done poorly on his exams. So, Father Morgan banned him from meeting, talking to, or even corresponding with Edith until he was 21. Tolkien obeyed this with one notable early exception, um, over which Father Morgan threatened to cut short his university career if he did not stop. Uh, so, needless to say that Father Morgan was the cock blocker of the century, for real. But, on the evening of Tolkien's 21st birthday, he wrote to Edith, who was living with a family friend named C.H. Jessup. Tolkien declared that he had never ceased to love her and asked her to marry him. Edith replied that she had unfortunately already accepted the proposal of a man named George Field, the brother of one of her friends. Edith said she had agreed to marry Field only because she felt quote-unquote, on the shelf, and had begun to doubt that Tolkien still cared for her. She explained that, because of Tolkien's letter, everything had changed. Okay, like, fuck. Imagine waiting days for answers here. Confessing your love, alright? Confessing your love and proposing, then being left on red purely because logistically you can't get an answer faster than a week or two due to the postal system then. I mean, it feels way more romantic than some dude texting you after a couple years to tell you he's ready for a relationship now, which is the story of my fucking life. But I digress. 
On January 8th, 1913, Tolkien traveled by train to Edith's and was enthusiastically met by her on the platform. The two took a walk into the countryside and talked. By end of day, Edith had accepted to um, Tolkien's proposal and she wrote to her current fiance, Field, um, saying, hey, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, not sorry, um, and then she returned her engagement ring. Um, Field was obviously upset at first, and the Field family was insulted, to say the least. Um, people had a lot to say about her marrying Tolkien, saying shit like that while he was a cultured gentleman, he had no life prospects or skill that would put him in a position to, to ever marry. Which I feel like is insane, obviously. Uh, we all know who he grows up to be, so this is, is uh, quite funny. <laughs> Edith Bratt and Ronald Tolkien were formally engaged in Birmingham in 1913 and married at St. Mary Immaculate Roman Catholic Church in Warwick on March 22nd, 1916. Why do churches have the craziest names I've ever seen? just that's just too many words it's too many words we don't need that many words it's a church just say hey they got married at a church fuck sorry i'm drinking root beer again if you subscribe to my patreon you can see the video episode and you can watch me drink root beer that's for real okay for real though in his 1941 letter to his son Michael, Tolkien expressed admiration for his wife's willingness to marry a man with no job, little money, and no prospects except the likelihood of being killed in the Great War. He has said that he saw that Edith was real, much realer than most people he had ever met. Oh, my fucking heart just shit its pants. Honestly, hand to God, just so sweet, so romantic. I think for most people, we wish to be seen in a similar way or just to be seen in general. And this kind of romance feels antiquated, but it also just doesn't exist in the same way anymore. Ugh, it just is so good. I love it. So, in August 1914, Britain entered the First World War. Tolkien's relatives were shocked when he elected not to volunteer immediately for the British Army, <laughs> which is crazy to me, obviously. Um, in a 1941 letter to his son Michael, Tolkien recalled, In those days, chaps joined up or were scorned publicly. It was a nasty cleft to be in for a young man with too much imagination and little physical courage. Instead, Tolkien entered a program by which he delayed enlistment until completing his degree. Now, by the time he passed his finals in July 1915, Tolkien recalled that the hints were becoming outspoken from relatives. Straight up, his family was calling him a pussy behind his back because he didn't want to stop doing what he loved to voluntarily run off to die. Eventually, he did go, though, as there was no way around it, and he actually became um, a lieutenant. Uh, in a letter to Edith, Tolkien complained, Gentlemen are rare among the superiors, and even human beings are rare indeed. Following their wedding, Lieutenant and Miss Tolkien took up lodgings near the training camp. On June 2nd, 1916, Tolkien received a telegram summoning him to Folkestone for posting to France. The Tolkiens, which is so cute to say, I fucking love that. Uh, the Tolkiens spent the night before his departure in a room at the Plough and Harrow Hotel. He later wrote, Junior officers were being killed off, a dozen a minute. Parting from my wife then, it felt like a death. While waiting to be summoned to his unit, Tolkien sank into boredom. To pass the time, he composed a poem entitled The Lonely Isle, which was inspired by his feelings during the sea crossing to Calais, France. To evade the British Army's postal censorship, he developed a code of dots by which Edith could track his movements. So 
not only is this motherfucker romantic as hell, he's developing like a code language so his own wife can keep track of where he is. He found himself commanding enlisted men who were drawn mainly from mining, milling, and weaving towns. It's been said that Tolkien felt an affinity for these working class men, but military protocol prohibited friendships with other ranks. Instead, Tolkien was required to take charge of them, discipline them, train them, and probably censor their letters, if possible. He was supposed to inspire their love and loyalty, which Tolkien had a hard time doing. Tolkien later lamented, the most improper job of any man is bossing other men. Not one in a million is fit for it, and least of all those who seek the opportunity. And honestly, some people really need to hear that shit for fucking real. Especially in our current climate, if you are someone that is seeking power, you deserve it least of all. Thank you, Tolkien. Fuck. God, fuck. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm gonna drink some root beer and we're gonna carry on. Listen, AMW, if you're listening, feel free to sponsor me. I fucking love root beer. Huh. So, Tolkien arrived at the Battle of Somme in early 1916. Um, Tolkien's time in combat was, as anyone could imagine, an incredibly stressful time for Edith, who feared that every knock on her door might carry news of her husband's death. Edith could track her husband's movements on a map of the Western Front, and while Tolkien was in the trenches, it's been said that he and his brothers were eaten by, quote-unquote, hordes of lice, which honestly sounds so horrific to me, like truly so horrific, these conditions. On October 27th, 1916, as his battalion attacked Regina Trench, Tolkien contracted trench fever, which is a disease that is carried by lice. He was sent back to England on November 8th, 1916. Many of his dearest school friends were killed in the war. Among their number were Rob Gilson of the Tea Club and Barovian Society, who was killed on the first day of the Somme while leading his men into battle, which just truly heartbreaking. And then fellow TCBS member Joffrey Smith was killed during the battle when a German artillery shell landed on a first aid post. Which is which just so sad. These are Tolkien's friends. And, you know, there really is such a thing as, like, survivor's guilt. And I did some research, and I don't ever really see Tolkien touching on that too much. Um, I can't imagine he didn't feel it, but maybe he just didn't talk about it. But I can only imagine, um, you know, the weight he bared from, from surviving. Um... So Tolkien's battalion was almost completely wiped out following his return to England. Again, just the guilt. Can you imagine? Like, war is just so insane, and it just does so much psychic damage to you. Ugh. A week in emaciated Tolkien spent the remainder of the war alternating between hospitals and garrison duties, as he was deemed medically unfit for general service. Um... But during his recovery in a cottage in Little Haywood, Staffordshire, he began to work on what he called the Book of Lost Tales, beginning with the Fall of Gondolin, which we know. Lost Tales represented Tolkien's attempt to create a mythology for England, a project he would abandon without ever completing. Now, he may have abandoned this, but he did kind of take a lot of what he did in the Lost Tales with this mythology and kind of bring a lot of that over to Lord of the Rings. So we do kind of get some of that and we will talk about some of that in other episodes. Um, but I do think it was really cool for him to kind of sit down and think of a mythology for England in the way that, you know, Norway has Norse mythology. I think that's really, uh, just really compelling. Uh, so Tolkien was promoted to the temporary rank of lieutenant on January 6, 1918. When he was stationed at Kingston upon Hall, he and Edith went walking in the woods nearby, and Edith began to dance for him in a clearing among the flowering hemlock. 
After his wife's death in 1971, Tolkien recalled, I never called Edith Luthien, but she was the source of the story that in time became the chief part of the Silmarillion. It was first conceived in a small woodland glade filled with hemlocks. In those days her hair was raven, her skin clear, her eyes brighter than you have ever seen, and she could sing and she could dance. But the story has gone crooked, and I am left, and I cannot plead before the inexonerable Mandos. Ah, oh, God, that literally <laughs> makes me want to cry. It's just so romantic, the way that he talks about Edith and the way that he talks about uh, losing her. For context, Mandos is essentially an all-powerful being that could grant those in purgatory life again, um, but is rarely moved to do as such. So, Tolkien wished that he had a Mandos to beg to, to essentially bring Edith back. And so, when we talk about Baron and Luthien in a future episode, it will really kind of give a lot of color and context to just how much Tolkien loved Edith and the way that he viewed her and the way that he saw her. Um, so I truly can't wait to, to do that episode, which will be in this season for sure. So on July 16th, 1919, uh, Tolkien was taken off active service with a temporary disability pension. On November 3rd, 1920, Tolkien was demobilized and left the army, retaining his rank of lieutenant. His first civilian job after World War I was at the Oxford English Dictionary, where he worked mainly on the history and etymology of words of Germanic origin beginning with the letter W. Like, such a widely, like, like specific job, and I just think that's, like, really cool. In 1920, he took up a post as reader in English language at the University of Leeds, becoming the youngest professor there. In mid-1919, he began to tutor undergraduates privately, most importantly those of Lady Margaret Hall in St. Hugh's College, given that the women's colleges were in great need of good teachers in their early years. And Tolkien, as a married professor, which apparently was very uncommon then, was considered suitable, as a bachelor would not have been. <laughs> During his time at Pembroke College, Tolkien wrote The Hobbit and the first two volumes of The Lord of the Rings while living at North Oxford. Um, which is crazy, that's a crazy undertaking. He wrote The Hobbit and the first two volumes of Lord of the Rings. That is so much, like so, so much. I think any writer listening to this is like, fuck, that's <laughs> a fucking lot to write. In the run up to the Second World War, Tolkien was earmarked as a code breaker. In January 1939, he was asked to serve in the cryptographic department of the Foreign Office in the event of national emergency. Okay, n like none of this, none of these words made sense to me. I was like, cryptographic who, what, codebreaker what? Um, but truly so sick what he got to learn. So beginning on March 27th, he took an instructional course at the London headquarters of the government code and cipher school, which is a school that you can go to, to learn code and ciphering, which is crazy to me. So yeah, so he attended this school. He learned all about code and ciphering, which he was a natural at considering his like proficiency with languages and creating languages, right? Um, he was informed in October of that same year that his services would not be required, but now my man's unlock a new skill set, code ciphering. Dude, like, my man just has code ciphering in his brain now. Like, just learn that skill. It's in his brain. He has it. Truly just so sick. So, in 1945, Tolkien moved to Merton College in Oxford, becoming the Merton Professor of English Language and Literature, in which post he remained until his retirement in 1959. Tolkien finally completed The Lord of the Rings in 1948, close to a decade after the first sketches. The Tolkiens had four children. 
and Tolkien was very devoted to his children and sent them illustrated letters from Father Christmas when they were young. Um, truly some real dad of the year shit here, um, and I love that. During his life in retirement from 1959 up to his death in 1973, Tolkien received steadily increasing public attention and literary fame, obviously. In 1961, his homie C.S. Lewis even nominated him for the Nobel Prize in Literature. The sales of his books were so profitable that he regretted not retiring early. In a 1972 letter, he deplored having become a quote-unquote, cult figure, but admitted that even the nose of a very modest idol could not remain entirely untickled by the sweet smell of incense. Fan attention became so intense that Tolkien had to take his phone number out of the public directory, and eventually he and Edith moved to Bournemouth, which was then a seaside resort uh, patronized by the British upper middle class. Tolkien's status as a best-selling author gave them easy entry into polite society, but Tolkien deeply missed the company of his fellow Inklings. Now, Inklings were a casual literary discussion group that Tolkien was associated with during his time at Oxford. Um, so even though now Tolkien is like incredibly famous, his book is blowing up, he's a big deal, he's essentially a household name. Um, he's not into it, he doesn't like it, which I feel like is just very, it's very Tolkien. It feels very, like, on brand for him. But, I digress. And, like, fame is a weird thing. Listen, I'm not even, like, remotely famous, but I highly suggest trying to remove your personal information from public record just in case some perv goes looking for it so he can find your mailing address to send you his crusty jizz sock. Because apparently, that's a thing people do. I would know, unfortunately. Um, but that is a story for another time and probably another podcast. Anyways, Edith, however, was overjoyed to step into the role of a society hostess, which had been the reason that Tolkien selected Bournemouth in the first place. The genuine and deep affection between Ronald and Edith was demonstrated by their care of each other's health, in details like wrapping presents, in the generous way that he gave up his life at Oxford so she could retire to Bournemouth, and in her pride in his becoming a famous author, she was truly so proud of him, and while Tolkien didn't love the attention, she loved to parade him around. She truly was so proud of him. And, you know, they were tied together, too, by love for their children and grandchildren. They, they were truly a unit in every sense of the word, and they just worked. So now we're going to go into the final years, and we're going to wrap this baby up. Edith died on November 29th, 1971, at the age of 82. Ronald returned to Oxford, where Merton College gave him convenient rooms near the high street. He missed Edith, obviously, but he did enjoy being back in the city that he loved. Tolkien was made a commander of the Order of the British Empire in the 1972 New Year Honors and received the insignia of the Order at Buckingham Palace on March 28, 1972. Um, I don't know what any of that means, but I'm proud of him. That sounds really great. It sounds very fancy. Uh, it sounds like he deserves it. Um, in the same year, Oxford University gave him an honorary doctorate of letters, and that is sick. That I understand, and that is very sick, and he does deserve that. Oh, God, this fucks me up. So, he had the name Luthien engraved on Edith's tombstone at Wilbercott Cemetery in Oxford, and... When Tolkien died only 21 months later on September 2nd, 1973 from a bleeding ulcer and chest infection at the age of 81, he was buried in the same grave with Baron added to the name. Bro, <laughs> what? Okay, if you're listening to this, you're like, stop cackling, you fucking banshee. Um, but if you're watching this on the Patreon, I low-key, high-key, <laughs> fucking crying. It is, like, just so beautiful to me. And, like, what, like, truly fucks me up about it is, like, you know, Edith 
Edith knew that Tolkien loved her, right? Like, she knew that. There's no doubt about it. But she didn't know about Baron and Luthien, and she didn't know that she was the inspiration. And she died not knowing that he would pay homage to her in such a way. Like, she had no idea that... <laughs> that Luthien was going to be on her tombstone or that Tolkien was going to share a grave with her. Like, it's, I don't know. There's just something, like, so deeply romantic and poetic about it. And maybe I'm a sucker. No, I, I definitely am a sucker for this kind of stuff. Um, I love romance when it's done right. And this is, is, is done right. Like, their romance is perfect. Um, yeah, so... Fucking don't DM me unless you're on some shit like this, is what I'm saying. Well, <laughs> that actually wraps up the life of Tolkien. And there are so many things I'll go into more detail on in future episodes, like language and the full story of Baron and Luthien. But wow, fuck me, right? What a ride. So tell me what you guys learned and if you didn't learn anything. Well, it must be cool having such a big brain. <laughs> Good for you. Thanks for listening to me essentially read Wikipedia at you. And I hope to see you stay with me. In fact, I am begging you to stick around. And you can find all of our social and Patreon information over at www.youhavemyswordpodcast.com. And before I go, I'd like to shout out another Tolkien creator for you to check out. Um, this is something I'd really like to do at the end of every episode is kind of pass you on to another Tolkien creator and um, I'm really excited about this guy. He is certainly one of my favorites. He is a charming Tolkien historian on TikTok and his TikTok handle is new better do better spelled B-E-T-T-A and this motherfucker goes so hard. We love him. Go send him some love and repost his shit, please. And remember, just like Aragorn said, when you're here, you're family. Just kidding, this isn't an olive garden, but the breadsticks are still unlimited. But for real, thanks for listening. And remember, you have my sword. Oh my god, Rachel, we have done it. Cue up the outro music. <laughs> Do we have outro music? Can we play Venga Bus? How does music licensing work? I don't know. Play whatever you want, Rachel. I appreciate you. Okay, bye! <laughs>